Welcome viewers to another exciting program of the pillar of the community. In today's program, we are very, very, very excited to have our, this particular guest. Um, this particular guest is a well-known person, uh, you know, throughout North America, throughout the world, I would say. And um, we are quite happy to have on our program today, Imam Siraj Wahaj. And of course, sir, you know, Imam Wahaj doesn't need any introduction, but you know, if there are any one of you out there who may be wondering, he's a globally recognized Islamic leader with over 40 years of experience in sharing riveting messages that have sparked the minds and inspired the soul. Uh, you know, his message is rooted in hope and faith and the power of redemption. Uh, Imam Wahaj is the Imam of Al Taqwa Mosque in Brooklyn, New York, and is the leader. He, oh, he, and the leader of the Muslim Alliance in North America. He was also a former vice president of the Islamic Society of North America, or ISNA. And with that, I would like to welcome to the program Imam Wahaj. Assalamu alaikum, Imam. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. So good to see you again. And I want to say that um, I really had a wonderful time in Canada uh, last weekend. It was a great experience. And, and I want to thank all of the brothers and sisters that were involved in trying to build that Masjid Ibrahim. And, and you know, we appreciate, we really appreciate that. And, you know, it was a certainly, certainly a pleasure meeting you in person. And, you know, we took great pleasure in, in, in hosting you here. It was certainly a pleasure having you here in Canada. And we look forward to you returning. <laughs> yes, done. <laughs> just just book me yeah inshallah inshallah good good so imam let's get right into it so i uh, you know in this little interview uh, i just want to find out about you the man imam siraj wahaj tell us tell us about your story about you and coming into islam yeah alhamdulillah you know i had a um an interesting introduction to islam um you know the prophet peace and blessing every one of you are born by nature muslim and your parents make you a Christian or a Jew or whatever the case may be. That's exactly what happened to me. Uh, I was born in a Christian family, alhamdulillah. So I was a um, not only a Christian, but I was a Baptist. And the reason that I was a Baptist because my parents were Baptists. And I, I grew up in the church. Uh, I really loved the church. Um, so um, alhamdulillah, when I went to um, high school, and I began to read about this man, Malcolm X, at Haj Malik Shabazz, and I fell in love with him. And I used to go around quoting Malcolm. Malcolm said this, Malcolm said this, you know? And um, so when I went to New York University, uh, um, my second year, 1969, um, I heard about the teachings of the Nation of Islam, where Malcolm was a minister, Muhammad Ali, and people like that. And so in 1969, I joined the Nation of Islam and, um, and became a, a minister in the Nation of Islam. So I remained in the Nation of Islam from 1969 to 1975. Something interesting happened. The leader of the Nation of Islam, um, Elijah Muhammad died. And, and as Allah would have it, he died one day before the national, their national holiday which means that all of us were on the way to Chicago. That's where we had our national meeting, we were on our way to Chicago. And we learned when we got on the plane that he had died. And so why is that significant? Because right there, we made a determination of who the new leader is gonna be. So after Elijah, Elijah Muhammad died, his son took over, Wadufuddin Muhammad, at that time called Wallace Muhammad. And he, brought us from the Nation of Islam, who was a, a group of people, you know, love black people, black culture and things like that, but not really, not really Islam. If you understood Islam, what Islam means, the belief in the oneness of Allah and Prophet Muhammad being the last prophet. So it wasn't until 1975 when Elijah Muhammad died, his son, Imam Warfudi Muhammad took it over and immediately within that first year, transformed us into Orthodox Muslims. And that, that is when I was in the Nation of Islam for those six years, Malcolm was in the Nation of Islam for 12 years. Malcolm will tell you, if you read his book, by, by the way, I recommend people read the autobiography of Malcolm X. It's a must read. And he will tell you there that, you know, 1964, he made pilgrimage to Mecca. And he will tell you himself that he was embarrassed that he didn't know how to make Salat. 
In the nation of Islam, we prayed. Right. But the Prophet said, Salu kamara aytumuni usali, pray as you see me pray. Right. So we didn't make the ritual salats, you know, okay. make a ruku and all of that. We didn't do that, but we prayed. Right. But alhamdulillah, in 1975, we learned how to pray. Okay. In the nation of Islam, we fasted every year. And we called it Ramadan, but it wasn't in Ramadan. It was in December. What, what, so it what, wasn't until... Why, why, why do? Why, what's the I think, yeah. I think that Mr. Elijah Muhammad wanted to make it easy for his followers. Because, oh, you know, sometimes Ramadan can be in those long, hot summer days. Right. So the way he did it, uh, every December, shortest days of the year, yeah. it's easier. Yeah. Okay. So I think I think that's why he did it. Right. And so when his son took over, he had us to fast in the month of Ramadan. So so the prophet says, Salu kamaru utumuni yusalli, pray as you see me pray. Right. Fast in the month of Ramadan. So alhamdulillah, we began to really uh, practice the Islam in 1975. So then I became an imam. In Imam Wal Fadi Muhammad's community, and that's my that's my story. Uh -huh. You know, and people, you know, Riyadh, they have all kinds of stories on how they became Muslim. Um, and you know, some were Christians, some were Jews, um, some were atheists, and so we have a whole list of people, and, and many like yourself, born to Muslim parents, right? And um, you know, you guys are lucky. Yeah. <laughs> you were really lucky and fortunate that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had us. Alhamdulillah, I'm I'm grateful. Right. Uh the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my life is the day I became Muslim. Yeah, and that that that's what I want to get. What triggered that? Because you know, every every person who's con who was reverted into Islam, there was some moment in their life that switched them or caused them to be Muslim or to start researching about Muslim or something or some friend that inspired them. In your case, what was it like? Did you start? It's unique, it's, it's unique right? I was um, <clears throat> attracted to Islam and the nation of Islam. Okay. The same thing, like people like Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X, very forceful. You have to appreciate um, the history of African Americans. Um, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Malcolm X. I know you probably never saw any movie ever in your life. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a movie. That was a movie called Malcolm X, right? Played right. by Denzel Washington. It was a really great movie, yes. and 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 it will show you um, Denzel playing a young Malcolm. He did what black many black men did. They conked their hair, which means they straightened their hair. Okay. Black men, you know, they have kinky hair by nature. Right. So when black when a black man straightened his hair, it was because he wanted to look white. Okay. Black people used to put on cream to make their skin lighter. Right, right. So there was a hatred that one of the things that Mr. Elijah Muhammad did, he made black people to love themselves. Oh, and this yeah. is one of the things that I got from the Nation of Islam. So my my love was for first joining the Nation of Islam, uh, learning about the history of black people, um, being oppressed in, in, in America, we learned to fight against injustice. So that was the that was the real attraction. For many of us and then islam then to the real islam became easy because once elijah muhammad died and his son took over immediately he began to teach us about islam um so though we thought we were muslims and alhamdulillah we were we, we tried the best that we can but really not really understanding islam like for instance uh in the nation of islam we were taught that a man named Fad muhammad was god in person but that can never be accepted by Muslims, right? right. So right. that's how that's how it began. So when Imam Muhammad taught us about the real nature of Allah, as the Prophet Muhammad told Ma'ad, he said, right. Let the first thing you do, invite them to the oneness of Allah. So right. Imam Muhammad was the one who gets the credit for actually teaching us about Allah, number one. And number two, in the nation of Islam, we were taught that Elijah Muhammad was a messenger of Allah. But we know that's not true. It can't be true. Right. Because the Prophet Muhammad says, There's no prophet after me. Allah calls him Khatim and Nabiyin. He's the seal of the prophets. So, so the son of Elijah Muhammad, befitting, was the one who taught us, no, the last prophet was Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. So for us, it was a natural uh, transition from being in a very pro-black uh, organization, nothing was wrong with that, 
right. teaching us to love ourselves and respect ourselves, fighting against injustice. All of that was good. Um, and alhamdulillah, he called us Muslims. Uh -huh. Alhamdulillah, 1975, we really adopted all of the, the, um, the tenets of Islam. Right. Good. Good. So, you know, I, I have a, a, a question here, but I, I think I know the answer to it, but I'll ask it anyway. In your 40 years of service, you know, to, to the Muslim community, you must have met some interesting people or been to some interesting places. Tell, tell, tell us a story about one of these persons you have met or place. Well, one, of the, one of the interesting people that I've met is you. <laughs> people like you. I'm not all that interested. <laughs> no, no, you are. You know, you are. But let me tell you, I, I think probably if I would have to name uh, one incident, one place that I visited among the places around the world, it would have to be South Africa. And I'll yes. tell you why. I've been to South Africa twice. Yes. I've been, I was there before uh, doing apartheid. Right. Then I came again after apartheid. And why I say that is most significant um, because of, I think every once in a while, something happens on the planet that captures our attention, right. such as Mel Nelson Mandela. Let me tell you why. Right. I, I visited the prison that he was in. He was in prison for 27 years. Yes, he was, yes. Why was he in prison? Fighting against apartheid. Yes. So this was a real hero. You know, John F. Kennedy, he was one of the presidents of the United States, mm -hmm. says that those who will make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. So people like Nelson Mandela and others fought against the apartheid, but in the later years, it was a peaceful kind of uh, a, a protest. So the place that he spent 27 years in prison is now the museum. Every year, millions of people all over the world, white and black, right. come to visit the prison that Nelson Mandela was in. Uh, right. Then we went to Soweto, uh, to the home, and I walked through the home uh, of Nelson Mandela. So I think every once in a while, something really significant happens and Allah shows us something. Such was Nelson Mandela. Right. Here's a man in prison 27 years. He comes out and he gets the Nobel Peace Prize. Right. Then he becomes the president of that very country. Country, yes. <laughs> but not only that, I want to, to just think for a moment about the day that he died. Yeah. Five days later, there was a memorial for Nelson Mandela in South Africa. Interesting to note, 93 heads of state attended that memorial. Yeah. That's unheard of. There's only about two countries in the world, 200 yes. countries in the world. Yes. 93 heads of state, four present presidents, yeah. of, four presidents of the United States of America. Yes. Obama, um, Clinton, uh, yeah. Bush, and Carter. 26, 27 House of Representatives of the United States. And I want you to think about all those kings and prime ministers and presidents who came, even in the Muslim world, all throughout the Muslim world, heads of state came. Can you imagine the logistical nightmare? <laughs> 93 heads been. of state. It would have been, yes. Of course. Yeah, yes. So I'm saying that um, going to South Africa, visiting that country, you know, right. witnessing people, you know, get real freedom. I think that's one of the greatest experiences for me in my life. I've, I've been I've been around a lot of places, and I enjoy it. everywhere I go, everywhere in America, everywhere around the world. I really enjoy it. I think the most significant was was South Africa. South Africa, yeah, and um, you know, it, it, not just the logistics of all those important people being there, but what it is he achieved to cause those people to go there. You know, that's the, the impact point. he left. You know? That's the point. Yeah, yeah, that, that yeah. That's the point. That's that's the, that's my point. You know, it's one thing to um, you know, order someone to go somewhere to do something, but spontaneously. Yeah. All of these people, important people, stopped whatever they were doing yes. to go to South Africa to give respect and honor to that man. Yeah, for what he accomplished. Eh? Yes. He, exactly. Yes, good. Sure. So, Imam, tell us, I mean, you've been to the Caribbean, right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, so this program airs on Caribbean Showtime TV. I love so it. a lot of people from the Caribbean who views this program. Tell us about some of your visits to the Caribbean and then, you know, in your Dawa so in just vacation or any other time that you've been to the Caribbean. 
Yeah, I think the most important of, of all the places I've been to the Caribbeans uh, was um, Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. Um, I knew the, in fact, uh, one of the leaders of the Muslim community just died a couple of weeks ago, Abu Bakr. Yeah. And um, I, I, I heard from Abu Bakr that they were having some difficulty with the government. The government took their property or something like that. So I actually went there in Trinidad and Tobago at that particular time. I had a meeting with the government and tried to have some um, some uh, some negotiations. Um, un unfortunately, uh, when I left, uh, it was tragic that um, Abu Bakr led an attempted coup of the country. Yeah. Um, I forgot the year that it, that it happened. It was 1990. I remember that. I was yeah. in Canada. Okay, you were in Canada. Okay, good. Yeah. So I went back. I visited him. He was in prison. I visited him. And um, I was, again, trying to uh, see if we can mediate. But alhamdulillah, it worked out. They got some barrister from, from England and yeah. came and actually they, they were acquitted. I, I was really surprised. So I think being there and going there a number of times, I, I think my favorite place was 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 there in Trinidad and Tobago. And um and I loved it. I love went other places, you know, like Barbados. I think they have I was at the Sandy Hotel. San, yep, Sandy you, Beach. No way, you know yeah. that place. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> loved it. Loved it, yeah. Loved it, man. I'm now I'm, you see, you got me thinking about it now. <laughs> well, now I, I was thinking that you know, we need to get you back to the Caribbean, we need to get that, you there. You, there know? you go, yeah. So, alhamdulillah, I you know, that was the and then in Jamaica and, and other places. Um, I, I remember Jamaica, um, I, I forgot the year I went, but it seems like the next week they had a major um hurricane, Gilbert, maybe Gilbert. Gilbert, yes, Gilbert maybe, was a huge one. Yes, maybe was guilty. Maybe was guilty. Uh, yeah, Gilbert. Gilbert. Yeah. Um, so, um, but again, I enjoy everywhere I go. Big Shake, everywhere I go. I uh, love Guyana. Guyana. Guyana is a beautiful place. In fact, you know, in New York City, we have more Guyanese in New York City than all of Guyana. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you probably have a lot of Trinese there too from Trinidad. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we do. In my yeah. community, you know, our masjid, when we first started 40 years ago, it was just 25 of us. Right. And we were 100% African Americans, every one of us. Right. Yeah. So, um, but alhamdulillah, different people began, uh, started coming to our masjid. And now, you know, right before the pandemic, we had an average of Juma like 1,300 people. Right now, in our community, the African Americans maybe 20 percent, 25 percent max. Wow. We have 38 different nationalities in our masjid. Wow. So, people, so alhamdulillah, we begin to attract other people, and that's one of the beautiful things about Masjid Taqwa. Imam Siraj, he's African American, but not the entire congregation is African American. African -American. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, that, that's good, that's another achievement for you. <laughs> You know, uh, I read somewhere that, you know, when talking about Masjid Taqwa in terms of you and establishing, I, I read somewhere that when you first, uh, you know, established a mosque, it was in someone's apartment. Um, that that reminds me when I first moved, went to the Cayman Islands, we used to pray in somebody's uh, their, 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 their living room, right? Juma, <laughs> you know. This is exactly what we did. The brother Salim Abdul Sabo, I never forget this brother. May Allah bless him, him and his wife. And Naima opened up the apartment. Us, um, you know, on Fridays we was push the push the furniture in the other rooms. Yes, it was the same for us. We pack and up have, the furniture and make a big space and have, <laughs> and have Juma prayer right there in the, in the living room. Yeah. It, it was a great it was a great time. You know, Allah blessed us. Um, soon after that, maybe maybe a few weeks, maybe a month, maybe two months at max. Um, I saw a property, uh, for for sale. Right. And this property was owned by the city. And, and in order to get this property, you have to go to an auction. So we decided that we're going we're gonna to go to this auction. And so I went in the morning, right? And um, they had different properties and they were auctioning them off. And they were going at very high prices, 100000 200000 300000 And for this property, they said the minimum upset price was $30,000, which means you begin at $30,000. Yes. So you think it's going to go you know, 100,000, 200,000, stuff like that. So so we were there. And so I, I never forget, the auctioner said, such and such property, this is the one that we wanted to buy. You know, um, and I said, minimum upset. And I'm telling you this truth. And you're not going to believe this, right? Yeah. The auctioner said, minimum upset, 
going once, going twice, sold for thirty thousand dollars, and we were like, Alhamdulillah. What? <laughs> now you see, when Allah wants you to have something, He just make it happen. Yes, yeah. Afterward, after the auction, an African American man came to me and said, "You know what? I was going to bid against that property." When I saw that the Muslims bid for it, I don't want to bid against the Muslims. <laughs> wow. And he, had deep, he had deep pockets. He would have right. gotten it easily. I'll be honest with you. We, right. We're a very poor community, right? right. So, uh, And I consider it one of the greatest, uh, the greatest investment I ever made. Uh, right now, easily, without, without any hesitation, we get at least $7 million for that property. So is that the same property that you have the mosque on right now? Yes, same property. Oh, and wow. so, alhamdulillah, we've had expanded it over the years. And, and right now, uh, we plan to tear it down right. and build up maybe a 10-story complex. Right. Uh, so not only a school, recreation center, uh, okay. dawa center, uh, classrooms, and things like that, right. but also residential. So the residential will actually help us. Uh, bring income to the uh, to the to the community. So that's what that's what we're planning right now. But right. I love that community, and I, you know I remember that we had brothers and sisters started coming from Bang Bangladesh. Right. So we have like a nice sizable crowd, uh, brothers and sisters. So I I had a dinner just for them, and um, I said, you know, I'm the imam. Not, I'm not just the imam of the African Americans. I'm the imam for everybody in this masjid. Right. So tell me what you need. Tell me what you expect. How can I make it more, uh, you know, easy for you? Right. So alhamdulillah. So this is what we try to do. So we have brothers from Nigeria, uh, brothers from Sudan, and brothers from, uh, 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 you know, all over the world, brothers and sisters. So alhamdulillah, we try to incorporate them. And so whenever we have <coughs> different ethnicities, I, I incorporate them into the leadership. Right. So even though we started, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> 100% African Americans, and so our leadership now <clears throat> had to, you know, rec recon rec uh, reconcile the diversity in our in our community, and we have yeah, done that. Right. Alhamdulillah. Right. You know, I, and I, as you mentioned, Alan, about the community and starting that mosque, um, I, I, you know, I, I saw somewhere where that you were saying that that was one of the worst areas in New York. According and you guys to changed it. You according know. I, I really to, like to know. Yeah, so, you know, to share that with us, how did you go about doing that? You know, to inspire you know, we, some other people out there. We were in um an area; they have different police zones, and um, and according and now the head about that area, the police, um, said to me when we first got there that this is this part of the city is one of the worst in the, in in the city. Right. Uh, this this place is called Bedford Stuyvesant, and I'm telling you, we had literally we would have gunshots firing almost right. every day. It we in, in the block of our masjid um were um 15 drug houses where they would sell drugs. Wow. Abandoned buildings everywhere. So maybe now you understand why we got it for thirty thousand. <laughs> well <laughs> well but but no, I mean yes, but there was still somebody who was interested in that as well, you know. But that, I, that's you know, true. That's true, right? You know, so so, let me tell you let me tell you what happened, right? So um we decided we're Muslims. And we're gonna fight back. We're not scared of nobody. We're afraid of Allah only. So mm -hmm. we decided to have an anti-drug campaign. I went to the, the same precinct, 79th precinct, right. uh, and told them that I have an idea how we can close all of those drug houses, all 15 of them. And they were they were listening. Right. You know, I said that I want to have a massive anti-drug rally on a particular day. This was in January, right. 1988, I think it was. And um, and I said that what you what you could do is you can go to each one of those drug houses and have a raid and get them out. If you get them out, we will keep them out. That was that's that was the arrangement that we had. Okay. And they said, yeah, how are you going to do it? We're going to have a, a forty day and night anti drug campaign. So we would literally uh, march around the the blocks up and down have some brothers sit in the car some brothers standing in front of the drug house so when someone came to buy drugs we would say no more drugs are being sold here oh, and man. we did that 40 days and 40 nights this was covered 
every major newspaper in the world. They came from London, England. They came from France. They came from Amsterdam. They came all over to write about what we did. Times Magazine, Times Newspaper did a major story on the Muslim anti-drug uh, program. Mm -hmm. That happened. That changed the whole area. If you look at it now, no more drug houses, no more abandoned buildings. Um, when we first came uh, in that in that area, there was not one Muslim business, not one. And then a few years, we had over 30 Muslim businesses on that block, mm -hmm. you know, as a result of us opening up a masjid. And it became, it became a very famous area. Um, I, I remember after we closed those drug houses, it became so famous. It was in magazines, television. Uh, I remember uh, there's a bus that used to pass by our masjid. And every time they pass by a masjid, you see the people coming on the side of the window near the masjid. They said, there they are, there they are, there they are. <laughs> And, and, and I'm serious. I, I was. I, I never forget. I was in. You're famous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was sitting in. I was sitting in the masjid one day, right? An elderly woman. She said, "Can I come in?" I said, "Yes." Right. So she sat down. She had. Oh, an elderly lady. She said, "Um, you know, I used to hate the Muslims. Well, now I love them." She spoke to me, and she kept speaking. I said, "I said, madam, I'm so, I have to. I have to go." So, but my point is, is that it opened it up. I, yes. I remember a um, a businessman came to meet me in my office, and he said, "You know, uh, we like what you did. You closed down these drug houses." He says, um, "Could you do the same thing for me in my area? And how much will it cost?" <laughs> well, I said, "No, no, no. We ain't in that, we ain't in that kind of business, right?" <laughs> But you know what I thought though, what I was hoping that that people would would emulate what we did and do the same yes. thing all over. Say no, we don't tolerate that. You're not selling drugs here. You're killing the people, and we're mm -hmm. not going to tolerate it. And really, Allah blessed us. Uh, around the country and around the world, people are asking me, you know, Imam, can we do the same thing? And I said, I don't recommend everybody to do the same thing. We had in our mass, we had brothers who were trained. Um, they they trained every week. We have martial artists. We have right. some brothers in the police department. We have some brothers, you know, court officers, correction officers. So we had all of that. And so, and I said, if you're going to plan to do something like that, then consult with our uh, heads of security and then uh, we, we can help you. But I think that's one of the greatest things that we, we've ever accomplished. And, and I tell you this, um, even one of the drug dealers, he took Shahada. Alhamdulillah. Wow. Uh, yeah, I saw him one day after, you know, he was sitting across the street. Right. And we looked at dejected. And so I went and sat down next to him. I said, what's going on? He said, man, you you close us down. I said, you know what? That that stuff, those drugs is destructive to you and to the community. And so I spoke to him and he took shahada. Um, so I'm saying that I give all praise to Allah yeah. because it could have happened totally different. Yeah. It would have been yeah. really bad because these, these people... It's serious because I think what happened, be honest with you, they probably thought we would be there for a day or two. Right. That we would go about our business. But when they saw that it was really 40 days and 40 nights, by that time it's, it's done. Yeah. Muslim sister came to me. <laughs> True story. She said, ma'am, you know, I've been coming to this masjid for years. But you don't know. I used to buy drugs from this <laughs> very area. I said, yeah. She said, yeah, man, you closed us down. So a number of people, a number of people who used to buy drugs from there, from there, from there wind up becoming Muslim. Wow. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. That's fantastic, um, you know, to hear that kind of story. And I mean, I guess the, the, the property value would speak for itself as well, right? Yeah. That, it went from thirty thousand, what you got it for, to seven right. million now, right? I mean, that, least, that alone speaks to what you have done with that. Area. Absolutely, yeah. And, but but it, again, but see, the, again, the thing that I that I want, um, really trying to encourage people to stand up, you know, yes. stand up, fight, fight against injustice, and 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 again, don't be afraid. And I I know how it is. It's it's it's, it's difficult, you know. People people are afraid. Alhamdulillah, we have brothers in our community. Some of them used to be prisoners themselves. They used to be in jail themselves. So we have, you know, you know, professionals. We have lawyers in our community. We have judges in our community. But we also have people from the street. And as we say, we put it like this. You probably don't know what this means, but I'll say it, and then I'll explain what it means. We don't eat rabbit meat. I know you don't know that. You have no idea what that means. And don't, and don't let my daughter hear that she has a rabbit. <laughs> See, the thing is, 
See, what it means is that, and I'm not bragging, really I'm not bragging, I, I, I fear Allah, but we don't have fear like that. You know, we're not afraid of people. We're not scared of people. You know, um, we're afraid of Allah, and 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 we know that we have to we have to stand up against injustice, and no matter who who they are, the color of the people, you know, or whatever, we have to fight back. And and because they looked in our eyes and they saw that we were serious, that we weren't scared. Yeah. Um. And I think that that made a that made a major difference. And and, and not only that, but look at all the the good that came out subsequent in terms of Dawa. Where people, even the drug the dealer himself, converted right. to Islam, you know. So, exactly. like, yeah. wow, you guys. So, anyway, Ima, we're running out of time here. So, I just want, you know, give our viewers, you know, one piece of advice. Leave our viewers with one piece of advice as what we as Muslims should be practicing or, you know, inculcate or implement in our lives. You know, a lot of things, right? But one thing I think that if I would have one complaint against Muslims everywhere is the lack of dawah lack of inviting people to Islam. You know, uh, if you look at the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, think about it. When the Quran was revealed to him, who was the Quran for? No Muslims, handful of Muslims. So we have an, an obligation, you know, to, um, to go to the people. And as I mentioned, the Prophet mentioned uh, to Ma'ad, he says, um, let the first thing you do invite them to the oneness of Allah. This is the key. Aisha radiallahu anha, she taught us a very valuable lesson. If you think about this for a moment, right? Our religion is not a religion of thou shalt not do. Don't do this and don't do that. Yes, of course, there's some prohibitions, but that's not how it began. And I want you to note that um, the first time that Allah ever mentioned khamra, intoxicants in the Quran wasn't the first 13 years in Mecca. Allah never mentioned it once. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the Muslims migrated to Medina and Allah himself didn't introduce it. Listen to what he says, talking to Muhammad They're asking you. I'm not mentioning about Khamra. They're asking you about it because they feel something. Is this thing legal? Say in it is some benefit, but it's a harm, and the, and the harm is worse, but still didn't make it prohibited. Yeah. Now some Sahaba is drinking alcohol, and they get drunk, and one leaves the Salat, and he messes it up. Yeah. Then Allah, he reveals in the Quran, um, he says, salat wa antum hatta ma Do not approach prayer while you're intoxicated until you know what you're saying. Right. He still didn't make it prohibited. It wasn't until later, you know, leave it off. It's now haram. So it took a period of time. Yeah. So the Muslims must not start out talking to non-Muslims about what they shouldn't do. No. Yeah. Teach them what Mu'ad taught them first. He taught them the oneness of Allah. That's what you focus on that. Who Allah is. The one who's telling us to do this, who is he? Mm. Learn about Allah. So my my one advice is the da'wah. Never stop giving da'wah. Never stop inviting the people and inviting them in the best way, the way the Prophet did it, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And you will find out that you it, there'll be a major change in 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 all of Canada, all of the United States, all of Great Britain, all over the world. You will find that happening. So um, may Allah bless you and bless the work that you're doing too. Um, Zero Mortgage, I think that's the organization that you're part of. And I know you didn't ask me to mention it, but I'm saying I, I love what you're doing. Um, I love what you're doing for the Muslims. Give them an opportunity to 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 to, to buy a house. Uh, when I was in Canada, one of the brothers told me, he said, Imam Siraj, you can hardly find a house in Canada less than a million dollars. That is true. Yep. Yeah. So I'm okay. saying so. Um, um, I would I would push that too. I would push that. Try our best. Don't rent. Yeah. Do not rent. You rent for years, 40, 50 years renting, and you have nothing to show nothing. for. Yeah. Nothing to show for. Exactly. But a bunch of receipts. So yeah. I'm saying um, continue to do that. May Allah bless you. Love you, man. Really yeah. love you. So when you going to come to U.S.? I came so, in. When you come to U.S.? So I'll, I'll tell you, inshallah. So I, I, as the minute they, let, they lift that 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 restriction we have with this COVID and stuff, 
that, that is one of the plagues I need to come down to. Excellent. New York, yes. You got a restriction now with the COVID? So it, we have to do all this PCR testing and stuff like that, and then you're gonna. Aren't we worth it? Aren't we worth it? Aren't we worth it? <laughs> Yo, you're worth Aren't it. Aren't we worth, you're worth it? it? Yes, you're definitely worth it. That's for sure. <laughs> Inshallah. Listen, Inshallah. I love you, man. Keep up the great work, and and remind the people, man. Let's build this Masjid Ibrahim. Don't wait a long time. Let's build it, and I can't wait to come back to pray in there. Inshallah. Inshallah. And, uh, you know, Jazakallah Khair, we really you, appreciate man. you coming up here and you taking the Thank time you. speaking with us today. You know? man. Shukran, man. We look Salam. forward to definitely. All right, Shay. Take Salam. care. Salam. Salam. So that, my dear viewers, was Imam Siraj Wahaj. And, uh, you know, as you heard, he has a lot, over 40 years of experience and in the his service of Islam. And you can see some of the things that he has accomplished over those 40 years, including cleaning up one area of New York to making it, uh, you know, a fantastic era. Anyway, viewers, with that, um, we thank you very much for viewing and we'll catch you on the next one. Yeah.